Hey, welcome to Never Forget the Blood's Worldwide Bloodcast. My name is Barry Netherton, and we are here freeing you from religious bondage by reminding you of the simple gospel. That's right, my friends. And you know, part of the simple gospel, something very intricate and mandatory to make sure that you have the true simple gospel is the articulation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here, this is our Christmas special this evening. And so during Christmas, many people love to speak of the incarnation and of the birth of Jesus Christ. And there is hardly anyone that would deny that Jesus actually existed, that he was born. Now, in the last two weeks, we've discussed the nature of the Trinity and the nature of Christ himself being both fully God and fully man. If you've made it past those arguments, we're going to tonight discuss the power of his resurrection and the importance of his resurrection. Because not only do people not argue about whether or not Christ was born, there's very few people that will actually argue that Jesus died. But what is so pivotal in the gospel and what is so pivotal concerning your salvation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he actually died, that he bore your sins in his body and died. And then rising again the third day, he justified us. And I have a guess about what happened this last weekend, but I just want you to know, you know, you are watching NFTB TV. Cease striving, know that I am God. Relax. doesn't matter what you achieve, even if you go by a title. All right, so tonight we're going to be discussing the importance of the resurrection. And once again, my guest here tonight is Pastor Tom Jeffrey from the River of Life Full Gospel Church in West Point, Kentucky. Welcome, Pastor Tom. Thank you. Thank you. And so, uh, you know, I, I think this is such a great Christmas message to discuss about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, something that... Pastor Tom and I have in common. He's in, uh, his church is in Hardin County. Is, yeah. that, is that right? And, you know, my, my church is in Bullock County. And something that Hardin County and Bullock County share is the military base Fort Knox. And that's known as, uh, you know, where the all the gold is stored. But I'm going to share something with you tonight that Pastor Tom is going to be sharing some gold from the Word of God with you. So Pastor Tom, I want you to just take it away from here. Well, I, uh, first of all, I, I want to, what you just brought up there before I get into the message, talking about the gold, you know, the gold vault at Fort Knox represents the economy of not just the United States, but the whole world. And I remember not too long ago, we had a pastor's conference and uh, some of the pastors give out the areas that they pastored in. And I said, do you realize that we're put around this area to pray for the economy of the world. And uh, there's a reason why we're put here, not, not just for passion, but also to pray for people. And uh, when, when America gets blessed, everybody else gets blessed. And uh, we need to keep that in prayer, no matter what's going on, no matter uh, what uh, party is in office, we need to keep the country in prayer and uh, cover it and blanket it with prayer. So keep that in mind. But to get to the resurrection part of the message, uh, when you was talking about the power of the resurrection, it come to my mind that nothing could happen without the resurrection power. I mean, God created the heaven and earth. It took power to do that. Uh, He created man after his image, and uh, every, every creature there was, he created. It took power to do that. And uh, as the plan of salvation developed for mankind, 
he had to take on the body of a human, Jesus. He had to be born into this world. And I got thinking about the resurrection power. I know we're talking about Christmas. Uh, everybody talks about the birth of Christ, but I want to talk about a pro uh, part of it that I think a lot of people don't realize is that God knew that when he took on the body of a human as a baby and grew to be a man, he knew he had to die and resurrect. Mm. He had to lay his life down. Before Jesus was born, Jesus knew what his job was. He knew what he had to do. And uh, I think about that a lot when it says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him over to a plan of salvation for us uh, and took that resurrection power. And Jesus went through a lot. Now, Jesus had that resurrection power from when he was a little boy. Uh, one of the historians wrote a story about Jesus when he was a little boy. He took a bird that was dead and prayed for it and come back to life again. That is a resurrection power. So at birth, Jesus entered this world with resurrection power. We need to realize that. So I want to go with you uh, to Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 26 through 35 real quick. It says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying, and cast her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him, give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there shall be no end. Now we're talking about resurrection power, okay? And we're going to get to that in a minute. But we've got to realize we're setting the stage to get to that point. This was a plan of God. This resurrection power wasn't just something that happened. This is something before Jesus came in on the scene as a human, as a baby. It was a planned, a plan of God to get ready for it. And we see the 34th verse, Then Mary said to the angel, How shall this thing be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and overpower thee, and, and of the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, we've got to realize the Holy Ghost came upon her, overshadowed her. The Holy Ghost represents the resurrection power. We've got to realize that John the Baptist, when he was born, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. His mother, Elizabeth, was filled with the Holy Ghost. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost. So the resurrection power was already working. And we know Jesus, when he was baptized, come straight up out of the water and a mm. spirit of God come down upon him, lighted upon him. Amen. So we see the resurrection power working in the early part of Jesus' life when he was here. We look here in, uh, over in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. It says, And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, this is when he died, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And the angel said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, 
as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay mm. and go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, we've talked about the birth. We've talked about the resurrection. And everything in between the birth and the resurrection, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, raising the dead, casting out devils, healing the sick, saving the lost, all the things he did. You know, it shows us the resurrection power working. It's just, we don't realize when we talk about resurrection power, we're not talking about just the power at the tomb. Mm. We're talking about the life of Christ is the resurrection power. The beginning, from the beginning all the way to the end, up to this point right now, is the resurrection power of God. We look over in uh, John chapter 11, and this describes what who Jesus is. John chapter 11, verse 25 said, Jesus said unto her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he was dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this. We look at this scripture because of Lazarus being dead, but we got to realize Jesus is making a statement here. He wasn't just the resurrection because Lazarus had died. He was the resurrection because that was the plan of God from the very beginning. He is the resurrection, he said. So when we look back in Genesis, when he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, that was the resurrection talking. The resurrection worked from Genesis to Revelation. From one end of the scripture to the other, we see, we, we see the resurrection working. So we see Christ saying, I am the resurrection and the life, making a statement to us. We don't realize the power when we get saved and we start serving God, then we get filled with the spirit. We don't realize the power that we could tap into. You know, we say, well, maybe we'll get the gift of healing. Maybe we'll do this. No, we got to realize the nine spiritual gifts operate through the resurrected power of God. The fruits of the Spirit operate through the resurrection power of God. Hmm. The Word of God was written by holy men of God when they was moved by God, by the Spirit of God. That is the resurrection power of God. Without the resurrection power of God working, we wouldn't have nothing. We have to have the resurrection power of God. Now, we don't realize what we can tap into because our mind goes back to the scriptures because we don't see it as being the resurrection power. Well, you know, people praise, well, give me the, one of the nine spiritual gifts, the gift of healing, uh, laying on of hands, uh, uh, you know, casting out devils or whatever. Uh, you know, I want to be able to do these things. Well, how do they work unless it's only through the resurrection power? So when Jesus made that statement, it was a very powerful statement. Now, if you go with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, we're going to go on a little trip here. So I want you to get your pens, pencils, write down these scriptures, or follow me in the Bible, because I want you to see about a sign that the scribes and Pharisees wanted to get from God or get from Jesus. So go with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 and 39. And it says, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would seek a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there be no sign given unto it except for the sign of the prophet Jonas. I want you to mark that. There won't be a sign given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, I got studying this many years ago and got looking at it, and I found something in the Bible. Go with me to Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 
Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, out of the whale, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Now here's what I want you to look at. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Well, number one, we know that Jonah was not in the belly of hell. He was in the belly of a fish. He might have felt like he was in hell. The truth is, he was in the belly of fish. And I believe Jesus was trying to give us a sign here when he said, out of the belly of hell cried I. Sometimes we don't realize what Jesus was trying to say here. Now, a lot of people, they may disagree with me, but Jesus poured out his life unto death. Not only pulled out his, poured out his physical life, but he poured out his soul unto death. And I know some of the people saying, oh, no, no, I don't believe that. But let's, let's see what the scripture says about it. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, we'll start with. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So we can all agree it's talking about Jesus here. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, all of our sin, the sins of all mankind, was laid upon Jesus. I want you to see that. That's what it says here. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shares is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. His life was taken. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was punished for all of our sins. Ninth verse. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. His soul was perfect. He never had sin on. He never committed sin. Hmm. Nothing at all. He was without sin, the perfect lamb of God. But look at the 10th verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he is putting the grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. I want you to notice that. Not only was his body beaten for our sin, but his soul was made an offering for sin. Circle that. It's very important. He said, and he shall see his seed and prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he shall see the travail, which means suffering, of his soul. God would see the suffering of the soul of Jesus and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I would divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, and here is the scripture that really gets to the point. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. Hmm. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. It's one thing laying down your life for somebody. But to lay down your soul for somebody is another story. Most precious thing you'll ever have on this in this world is your soul. Not your life, your soul. Your soul determines whether you're going to heaven or not, if it's in right standing. He was in perfect uh, harmony with God. He was a soul that had never sinned. Yet, he took the sins of mankind upon his soul, the Bible says laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. 
A soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yet he never sinned, but he took on sins on his soul as though, as though he did sin, but he didn't. He never committed a sin. He paid the full price. We see the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and all it shows is the physical part, what happened in this world. But we don't see the supernatural part that happened beyond the grave, and we don't see it. it uh, if we was to open our eyes to it, it would break our heart. Jesus poured out his soul unto death. He loved us so much. And when I tell people that, you'll hear some denomination say, oh, no, he never, he never died like that. He, yes, the Bible says he did. Isaiah said he did. It, it, it clearly states it. How can we deny it? And why would we take away from God what he did for us? That's how much he loved us, that he not only laid down his physical life, he laid down his soul. He took our sins on himself as though he committed a sin, and yet he never done nothing wrong. Go with me to Psalms 22. Jesus cries out from hell. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? Now remember this. He is separated from God in hell because our souls is on his, on his soul. It said God shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He poured out his soul unto death in Isaiah. So he's crying out in hell. And he said, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest me not. And in the night season, I am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cry unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man. I want you to look at this. The worm here means soul. I am a soul. I'm not a human here at this point. A reproach of men despised the people. Back to the seventh verse, it says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip and shake their head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb and didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Jesus saying, you're it, God, that brought me for this occasion. I was born. So it does bring the Christmas season into it. It talks about, the, about him being born here. He says in the ninth, uh, tenth verse, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Jesus said while he's in hell suffering, look in the God the Father, Thou art my God from the time I was born into this world. And Jesus knew why he was born into this world, for a purpose. He knew it. And he said, thou art my father, my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there's none to help. He's in the depths of hell. Now, something that people don't realize the scientist has done a study on the earth, and in the center of our earth is a hard core mass, solid. Lava between the core and the outer crust. Abraham's bosom is on the outer crust. You'll hear people say there's the paradise side of hell. Listen, hell has torment. There ain't no such thing as a paradise side of hell. Anything to do with hell is not good. Jesus went over into hell itself. If you remember the story about the rich man in Lazarus, they said, the, the rich man said, Father Abraham, let Lazarus put his fingers in water and touch it upon my tongues, for in these flames 
I am tormented. And Father Abraham said, it's impossible. It can't happen for they that's over here cannot pass to you and you that's over there cannot pass over to here. So here is Jesus in the center of the earth at 10,000 degrees, soul suffering, pouring out his soul unto death, saying there's none to help. Well, there was nobody there to help him. Now, I want you to look at this 12th verse. Many bulls have compassed me about. Strong bulls of Bashan has set me, has beset me round. Now, many years ago, I got a hold of a guy's old-fashioned uh, concordance in a linear Bible. It had it break down in Greek and Hebrew. It was something that I've never seen nothing like it since. But when I looked this up and what he had, the bulls of Bashan had two meanings to it. One of them was the strong bulls that went down in the valley of Bashan and they would attack people or their houses. They'd hit them. It was steers. The second meaning was the strongest demons that guarded the gates of hell itself. This is what it's talking about here in the scripture. Jesus wasn't in the valley of Bashan at this time. He was in hell. So he was describing the strongest demon that guards the gates of hell, compassed him round about. 13th verse, it says, And they gaped upon me with their mouths as raving and roaring, as a raven roaring lion. They attacked him. Satan done everything they could do to keep Jesus in hell itself. Everything they could do brought the strongest demons he had. He was trying to make sure that Jesus never resurrected. And this is the power of the resurrection that, you know, when, when we say that Jesus would never went over there, then we're, we're making the power of the resurrection not as powerful as it describes it to be in the Bible. Uh, it says, I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shared. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou has brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked. They have enclosed me and they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be, but be not far from me, O Lord. O my strength has thee to help me. Deliver my soul. Here it's talking about his soul. From the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog, which is Satan. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou. Now, this is where Christ is starting to get his prayers answered while he's in hell. Thou has heard me from the horns of the unicorns, the wild oxen. Now, I want you to realize this. This is where the transformation starts taking place in the 22nd Psalm. He's in hell. He's crying out. Demons has attacked him. But he, all of a sudden, God hears him. Now, when God hears him, we've got to realize something. Jesus never committed sin. He don't deserve to go there. But yet, he went there. He volunteered to go there and take on our sins. And he went up to the devil, and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the devil. You realize Jesus never committed sin, but he was the first person ever born again. He got saved from your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world as though he had sin on his soul. And he did all of our sins, but yet he never committed sin. Okay? So God hears him when he cries out. He says here in the 22nd verse, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. Now, when he's talking about his brother, he's talking about the Jewish brethren in Abraham's bosom, okay? That's why he said, I'll declare thy name unto my brethren. Abraham's bosom's on the outer 
crushed. So now Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He come over the gulf that no man had ever could come over. Lazarus couldn't come over. Uh, the rich man wanted him to come, but there was a gulf there. They couldn't cross over. Jesus crossed over because his personal soul had no sin on it. And God heard his voice from the hills of the wild oxen. He cried out and he said, thou hast heard my voice. He goes to Abraham's bosom and he preaches, okay? He preaches there. And, you know, the Bible says when he resurrected, and we're going to get to that point in a minute, the spirits of the saints were seen in the streets. Well, what saints was there? Their spirits. They was the ones that died and they was in Abraham's bosom, okay? We got a scripture. We'll get to that here in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye see to Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye see to Israel. You see, he's in Abraham's bosom. Talk about the seed of uh, Israel and Jacob and all them. He's preaching to them. It says, For he has not despised or harbored the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from them. But when he cried unto him, unto God, he heard. Now, this next scripture is where he comes up to Mary Magdalene after he resurrected. He said, Touch me not, for I've not yet been glorified. I've not yet went up there. So she didn't touch him. And the reason why, look at the 25th verse. He says, My praise shall be of thee in thy great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. At this point, he goes into heaven. After he resurrected, he wouldn't let her touch him. He went up there and he paid his vows before the great congregation, which is in heaven. And the meek shall eat and be satisfied, and they shall praise the Lord that seek him, and your heart shall live forever. Okay, now we see this. Now, the resurrection power of Christ is so great. People just don't, they don't get it. They don't realize how powerful it is. Go with me to Matthew chapter 28, or 20, 27, excuse me, verse 52 through 54. It says, and the graves was open, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they greatly feared, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Well, they made a mistake. They should have said, truly, he is the Son of God. Because what they saw was the bodies of the saints that was dead come back alive again. When Jesus resurrected, everybody resurrected. When Jesus come out of that grave, every saint there was prior to him going in the grave they come out with him. When he went to Abraham's bosom, they had to accept him as the Messiah, and they did. At that point, Abraham's bosom was totally done away with. There's no need for it. He emptied it out. He emptied Abraham's bosom. There's nobody in there no more. It's over with. So we got to realize the resurrection of Christ is so supernatural that it had emptied out Abraham's bosom, the resurrection of Christ took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection of Christ proved that the strongest demons in hell itself could not keep him bound. So when we talk about the resurrection, I mean, it's, it's so supernatural. Mm. We get to Romans chapter 8, verse number 11. Hallelujah. It says, but the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, after I just told the story about Jesus being born, let, saying, let us make man in our image and creating 
heaven and earth, the resurrection power, took nothing and he spoke it into existence. That was the resurrection power. God having a plan of coming in through the Virgin Mary and becoming Jesus in the flesh and then growing up and then hanging on a cross for us and then resurrecting, defeating Satan in Satan's strongest point. He took it, the strongest demons that guarded the gates of hell and could not keep him there, tried. Jesus taking the keys of death, hell, and the grave from Satan himself. And then we see in the scripture, and this is very important for everybody to understand, but the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. My God. When we say, well, I don't know if I got power to pray. Come on, straighten up. Or I need somebody else to pray for me. If you're a born-again Christian, I want to tell you something. God's give you his power. His resurrection work, it already worked in your life when he resurrected your soul from spiritual darkness to spiritual life. That's the resurrection power of God is salvation. When he said you must be born again, that you become a, a new creature in Christ Jesus, all old things are passed away, and all things become new again. God's called you to the resurrection. If you're a born-again Christian, you cannot function without the resurrection. Amen. If you're saved, you know, you cannot function. If you're yeah. a preacher, you need to lay hands on the sick. You need yeah. to cast out devils. You need to operate in the power of God. And if you're not operating it, something's wrong with you. You're denying the power of God. God says right here, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I want to tell you something. If you're a preacher out there and you haven't seen the supernatural, it's because you're not trying. You're not putting yourself in the position to see it. That was one thing that was told to me by my brother. I said, why do you get to see miracles and stuff all the time and I don't? And he put his finger right in my face. He said, because you don't put yourself in position to see the supernatural. If you keep doubting it, you're never going to see it. If you keep denying it, it ain't going to happen. If you keep letting your faith get weak every time something comes along, you're pushing the supernatural out of your life. But the scripture tells me that it dwells in you. If it's inside of you, you've got to break the thing that's holding it bondage inside of your soul. It's probably what's in your mind. You've heard people say, well, that's one of the wild churches out there. They believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. Well, do you believe in God? That's what God is, is miracle signs, and wonders. Do you believe in the gifts? That's what those gifts are, is miracle signs, and wonders. We see these things. They're the supernatural power of God. Lazarus raised him from the dead. He believed it, I guarantee you, when he come out of the grave. Now, we look in Ephesians chapter 1, okay? I'm looking at the wrong... I need to be looking at the camera over here. Looking at myself on a monitor. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I just get all fired up when I get into these things. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 18, and this is what I should have been read, read, reading when I first started. The eyes of your mm -hmm. understanding being enlightened, they just was, praise God. That you may know what is the hope of your calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints. Mm -hmm. And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now look what it says here. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Listen, I've just gave a sermon out on his power, how great it is. How can we deny? How can we deny this power? He said, 
which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The fullness of him that fills all in all. Let me tell you, he fills all, and he fills it all completely up. We got to realize that. Go with me to chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse number 8. Paul writes here, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. You ever read that? has created all things by Jesus Christ. Amen. To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. According to the eternal purpose, which he proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence, by faith of him, wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. And for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by, the, by his spirit in the inner man. By his spirit, he wants that might, that power to be strengthened inside of you in the inner man that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith and that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. In other words, you get to be filled with the resurrection power of God because that's part of what he's filled up with. Think about that. We're talking about the resurrection power of God, and that's part of the fullness of God. So he wants you to be filled with all the fullness of God. Yes. Man, if we could just tap into it and realize it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and I only got this verse and another one, and we'll be wrapping it up here, but it says here in the 10th verse, that I may know him, Paul is saying this, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, and be made conformable unto his death. Now look what he says, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. You know, people say, well, that's, Impossible to know the power of Christ's resurrection. No, it ain't. Listen, I heard of a coroner one time that was in Florida. Come up, he was a new one that just started his job, come up on a scene, and a guy was in an accident, had died. He didn't know what to do, but this guy was a Christian. He laid hands on him. The guy come back to life. I've got a, a aunt. It's now she's dead. She'd be 100 and probably 15, 20 years old by now. But my cousin heard that his mom died in Mobile, Alabama, and he drove to the hospital. When he got there, they had already pulled the sheet over. She had already passed away, and he went in there, knelt down. He said he prayed, prayed the littlest prayer he ever prayed. He said, Jesus, will you bring my mom back to life? He said it silent to himself, and all of a sudden, she started coughing, and he started hollering for the nurses, and they ran back in there. She come back to life, and she lived probably another 15 years or, or more. I've got a guy in my church. His name's Eddie. He's an evangelist. He's up in age right now, but he had three nieces overdosed on drugs. All three of them died. When he got there, 
went to the hospital, laid hands on them, and all three of them come back to life. From what I understand, this is like many, many, many years ago. They're still living today. That's the resurrection power of God. When people tell me it can't happen, listen, there's many times it has happened. In Reinhardt Bunke's uh, revival, there was a preacher over in Africa, got a little sassy with his wife and left, got in an accident and got killed in an automobile accident, and they come and got her, and they put him inside of an ambulance, but he was already dead. She's riding with him. And she said, take him to the revival, take him to the revival. And they had several hundred people in a tent praying for the revival because he was preaching hundreds of thousands of people. The people in the tent gathered around him, prayed for him, and he come back alive. I've got a videotape on it. That's the resurrection power of God. When people says you cannot tap into that source. Listen, I want to tell you something. It has happened many, many, many times. And it can happen again. It can happen in your life. When I know that there's, there's, it's documented many times of people come back to life that had prayer. That proves that that resurrection power does dwell in us exactly like the Bible says. You might say, Pastor Tom, have you prayed for anybody to come alive? Well, I've prayed for people to get saved. I have seen great, great miracles. I'm waiting for somebody to die so I can pray, <laughs> command them, come back to life. Uh, I remember many years ago when my uncle got saved and I prayed for him and I was just a new Christian. He didn't come back to life. And I went home and said, Jesus, why didn't he come back to life? And he gave me the lyrics of the old song. When all my life is over and my work on earth is done, when my role is called up yonder, I'll be there. And I realized that, he, you know, he was like 85 years old. I guess he wanted to uh, go to heaven and not come back to earth. But the power of God is real. The power of God is real. I want you to look, and I'm going to close with this, these verses here. In John chapter 14, verse 11, I'll start with. Jesus said here, Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. In greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The name of Jesus gives you access, if you're a born-again believer, to the resurrection power. Remember that. Without him, without Jesus, we can't do nothing. We can't do nothing without Jesus. But with the name of Jesus, we have access. He says here, the 16th verse, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When Jesus resurrected in the book of John, he appeared unto them in the room and he breathed on them and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the book of Acts, he said, tarry in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. You know, us Pentecostals, sometimes we look at it as, well, it's a speaking of tongues. It, it, listen, the power from on high is the resurrection. Yes. That's the power. The resurrection power of God living inside of us. The tongues is a sign, okay? That's just part of it. But the tongues isn't where the power is. It's the resurrection anointing. That is the power of God. And just because if we think we can speak in tongues louder than somebody else, <laughs> that we're going to move God. No, we got to have what it's talking about, the power of God. Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, mm -hmm. but in the demonstration of the spirit and the power thereof, that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. 
The resurrection is the power of God from Genesis to Revelation, from his birth to his death and his resurrection. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwelleth in you today. And I want you to know that. Barry, I want to hand it back over to you and maybe you want to comment on it or say something. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful for you for you being on here and, and sharing this. You know, at, and there may be some things that, that Pastor Tom, maybe some uh, some finer points of theology, maybe in some of that that you might disagree with. But I want to I just want to challenge you to think further and, you know, to be for, so that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, as he said, uh, because, you know, Peter tells us that Jesus was made alive in the spirit after he preached to the souls in prison. And so, you know, that's something that uh, there is so much depth in just thinking about uh, all that's wrapped up in that, preaching to the souls in prison. And, but Jesus being made alive in the Spirit, now that coincides with Ephesians where he says, he has quickened you together to be the temple of God by the habitation of the Spirit or the habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so, you know, it is, uh, hey, hey, cousin, uh, Pastor Dallas up in Decatur, Illinois, watching tonight. Uh, we've got some people in uh, northern Indiana, over in India. Uh, we just, we bless you all. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you for watching this. Uh, it's, it's just, a, it's an honor to have Pastor Tom on with us on this broadcast. We'll definitely be having him back uh, on here. And I just want to reiterate you all that, you know, uh, once again, nobody in the world that has any sense, common sense, or, you know, that would give any uh, intellectual credence to history would deny that Jesus was born. And there may be some people that may deny that Jesus actually died. So they may say, well, uh, you know, he, he didn't really die on the cross, that, you know, he was, he was just... Uh, you know, very uh, comatose. And there's there's some people that, that do teach that. Uh, they're definitely not Christians, but, you know, there, there's a vast majority of people in the world won't deny that Jesus actually died. But the gospel hinges on the resurrection. And that also means that your salvation hinders on the resurrection. So if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then you are still in your sins. But because Jesus rose from the dead, my friend, that means that you can be justified. You can be washed completely clean. And so uh, as, as you see some of the links that are down there on your screen, I want to invite you, uh, if you have yet to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, just go to that web link that just popped up there, neverforgettheblood.org slash respond. And you'll see a little two-minute video that will explain the gospel in simplicity. And there's an opportunity for you to take another step and get plugged into a local church in your area. We will help you get connected in a local church. We believe in the power of the local body, the local expression of the universal body of Christ. Uh, as I'm a local pastor and an evangelist, and Pastor Tom never thought that he would be a pastor, uh, but <laughs> that's one of the things, I, I, one of the stories he tells, you know, but he does so much evangelism in his church. So if you are in the West Point area, I definitely want to uh, encourage you to uh, check out Pastor Tom's church, River of Life. It's right there on Dixie Highway, uh, just past the uh, Fort Duffield. What's that called? Yeah, yeah. Fort so, Duffield. Yeah, so uh, if you get off at the Gene, if you're coming from Louisville, get off at the Gene Snyder and head south on Dixie Highway, and you can't miss it. Big church with a blue roof and a light-up sign. And as my little four-year-old girl says, that big spiky thing up on top. One uh -huh. second, the, the, the steeple. <laughs> the steeple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, if they go to their website, that's right there, River Life Church. They can they can give a donation to to your ministry as well. Yeah. And so we want we want to give you an opportunity to sow into that. Uh, and just to answer uh, the the troll person here on YouTube, <laughs> uh, you know, no one is charging for the gospel. We've actually uh, we're like this broadcast is going out for free. So no one is charging for the gospel, but we do uh, receive support uh, and share support uh, to get the gospel around the world. Just like uh, we just did over in Malawi, uh, we raised funds to distribute them 
And uh, I want to share, we will kind of close out here. I uh, just want to show you a little bit more about uh, some of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is just, you know, giving uh, and sharing the word of God uh, with, with people like this around the world. Okay. And uh, so that's, so when you give, that's what you're giving into is planting churches uh, in other countries and uh, through our humanitarian aid projects in Asia. All right. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about more of that soon as well. This coming weekend, uh, we're having a Christmas party for our children in the school in Pakistan, uh, where we provide a free education for the children over there. All right. So, uh, you know, that's that's when you give into this ministry, that's what you're doing is you're supporting things like that. And uh, yeah, those pictures. Amen. Amen. Rachel, uh, those pictures of giving those Bibles to me. I mean, you know, Isaiah said uh, uh, Isaiah 55, Pastor Tom, Isaiah said that my word shall not return void, but it goes out and accomplishes that for which I sent it just as seed to the sower. And as bread to the eater, so shall my word be. And that's what, you know, we, we gave Bibles to pastors this weekend so that they can do Bible studies like this with their people. Digging into this word. As I told you, Pastor Tom, share some gold tonight. You know, there's some of the, some gold, some treasures in the scripture have, it's not necessarily that they're new, but it may be that they've yet to be uncovered or that they were sunken due to, to the shipwreck of former generations. And so, uh, you know, we, we share a lot about that I on this program. Go ahead. I'd yeah, like to say something. Say. I, I, this, this is not scripted, what I'm about to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, I, I, he was telling me there's about 1,200 people who don't have Bibles. If you're watching and you'd like to help out with Bibles, our church will match up to $2,000 wow. for Bibles. Okay. I don't know if we can get them, you know, for a couple bucks a piece, three or four dollars a piece. I don't have a clue if we can get them by the bulk, but there's 1,200 people who don't have a Bible. Some of the pastors didn't have Bibles. So our church will match up to $2,000. Uh, so Barry can keep an eye on that. I want to ask some of the pastors out there and some of the, not just pastors, anybody. I'm... Barry will tell you, I don't, I'm not a person to ask for money. I never do. He'll tell you that. Uh, matter of fact, I tell people in my church, if there's sin in your life, I don't want you to put a diamond off. Play mm -hmm. it. I, I want your soul. I, I don't want your money. I want your soul. God already owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I know that. But I feel like there's a need here for those people. When I heard this, the pastors don't have Bibles, and they're writing down they got some Bibles that got part scriptures in it, and they're trying to write it out. And they they give these pastors some Bibles. Thank God for that, because now they can at least preach to the people, but the people needs Bibles to follow the pastors. So uh I wanna I wanna do that. I feel really led of God to do that. And uh if if everybody would jump on board, let's do something for God. Let's get those Bibles in those people's hands. Uh you can get a hold of Barry and uh, so into it and, and uh, up to $2,000, you know, we're going to match. Okay. Amen. And, uh, we will do it, Barry. Amen. So if that's, so if, if you all out there come into that, so if we, so that's a total of $4,000, if we can raise, that'll be uh, roughly 300 Bibles uh, that we can put into the hands of, of these believers out there and actually my friends listen to this so we were talking about the power of resurrection and the power of healing pastor tom i didn't even share earlier uh but during the conference that we had where you can see where i was uh i was preaching virtually to the people there and there will be more clips of that coming out but there were people that weren't even a part of the conference but just visiting uh villagers that were just in the neighborhood they wanted to see what this big thing was that was going on outside with the with the projector and the speakers, and they came and hearing these messages. And I'm sharing about my favorite part of Christianity is the resurrection. Yeah, and that is part of the when I was describing what what is the message of the cross that Jesus died, he he was buried, and he rose again. 
And so when we, when we speak of the message of the cross, that's what we're talking about. The, the simple gospel that Jesus, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he died for your sins according to the scriptures. As, as Peter says, he bore our sins in his body and he died. And then uh, he preached to the souls in prison. He was made alive in the spirit. Okay, and so and then he ascended on high and he's coming back to judge. Next week, we'll be having another guest on here talking about the, the return of Christ. And that's another uh, essential doctrine uh, that you need to have uh, as a believer in Jesus. But the, the these people that came uh, just from the surrounding villages, there's over 50 people gave their life to the Lord. Amen. They weren't even Amen. part of this conference. I was teaching on leadership. And they got and saved. And these people ended up getting saved by hearing the gospel, the message of the cross being articulated. And not only that, but we hired a protection uh, that some of these pictures you're seeing is from a photographer. We sent a little extra funds to get some, some good quality pictures and stuff. And the photographer that we hired, he was complaining about severe pain in his bowels. And the pastors laid hands on him. And he went away jumping and leaping. And praising God, Amen. just like in the book of Acts there. And so, you know, this is, uh, is this, is, this is so powerful. And I'm telling you, my friends, it doesn't matter. Once again, you know, uh, like this, this ministry that we're in, we're, never forget the blood is not a church. We're a, we're a, a parachurch organization. We work with people across denominational spectrums. But I'm going to tell you something personally that I believe is that this last great move of God that's coming into our land is the breaking down of those denominational walls where everything is going to be lowercase except for the C in Christian. And so it doesn't matter what is your soteriology, what is your eschatology, you know, what, what is your ecclesiology. But if you've got, like we're talking about in this, in this series, these basic fundamental doctrines of the gospel, then you're our brother and sister. If we can agree that 1 Corinthians 15 is our gospel, then you're my brother and you're my sister. And we need to learn how to start working together. And, and so I just rebuke every spirit of jealousy and bitterness that's out there in the world tonight. Uh, and so, uh, you know, with that, I just want to leave you with uh, just a little clip of some of the worship uh, that happens uh, here in Malawi. Uh, I, I, this is just some of my favorite worship. And we'll leave you with this uh, little clip as we go. And I'll just say, my friends, until next time, see to it that no man steal thy crown and never forget the blood, the precious blood of Jesus. Ah, a sua na 